There was a lot that took me by surprise in the vision of Escaflone. Despite my love of mecha anime and 90s art, the show has pretty much eluded me. And by that, I mean I had no idea what to expect going into this. Beyond the description on Mal, I've literally got no attachment to the show, so much like Gundam Wing, this video is almost completely devoid of nostalgia. Fortunately for me, unlike Gundam Wing, I actually really enjoyed my entire time with Escaflone. And while it isn't a perfect show, and it sometimes gets weighed down with the gravity of its own ideas, Escaflone is a roller coaster ride of action, romance, and catgirls. Writer Shoji Kawamori originally came up with the idea for a fantasy based mecha romance series after visiting Nepal's foggy mountain region. After his basic pitch to Sunrise and Bandai, Kawamori was partnered with producer Minoru Takanashi and tasked with fleshing out the world and themes. They took inspiration from various myths from around the globe, and the series was greenlit for a 39 episode run directed by Yasuhiro Imagawa. Originally, Escaflone was going to be an action heavy shonen mecha series, but Imagawa left before the production actually began to do work on Mobile Fighter G Gundam leaving the series to be refined into a 26-episode anime. The new director, Kasuke Akane, who had previously done work on both F91 and Stardust Memory, decided to kind of remake the original script with broader appeal, and he's credited with adding a lot of the shoujo elements into the show. And of course, because this is Sunrise and Bandai, the show was cut from 39 episodes down to 26 episodes just as the production began because of budget issues. Despite the budget issues, Sunrise was all in on Escaflone. I mean, not only did they produce the anime in 1996, they had been producing it in conjunction with an already running manga that started in 1994. Then there was an alternate telling of the story from another character's point of view that released in 1997, alongside a light novel retelling as well. Finally, in the year 2000, there was a film released simply titled Escaflone that retold the story once more. Anyway, Sunrise must have felt fairly confident that Escaflone would at least be a small hit to commit so many resources to its multimedia production. Unfortunately, it missed sales goals when released in Japan, despite being pretty well received among both critics and the public. However, when Escaflone released in the West, you better believe that shit was popular. I mean, it outsold Gundam on video in the year 2000 in the West. Something about those pretty 90s boys just prints money over here, and you know what, I'm okay with it. Our story starts with normal everyday high school student Hitoni <laughs> Hitoni. Hey, I'm Hitoni. Hey, I'm walking here. Our story starts with normal everyday high school student Hitomi Kanzaki going about her daily routine. She's a track runner with a crush on a fellow student and a friend who pushes her buttons. A pretty normal kid, all things considered. Now, she does tell people's fortunes with a tarot deck, but hey, you know, witch talk is popular, so I guess the kids are into that. And when I say she has a crush on her friend Amano, she's like obsessed with him. The writers of this show really captured that high school first love cringe energy. During Hitomi's race, she has a vision of a warlike fantasy realm and ends up falling off of a cliff before waking up in the nurse's office. To everyone it seems like she just passed out, but Hitomi has absolutely no idea what she saw or why it was so lifelike. She shows Amano her pendant that was given to her by her grandmother, saying that it acts as a pendulum with a full second in between swings. Amano seems ready to confess something to her before they're interrupted. On their way home, Yukari tells Hitomi that Amano is moving out of the country because of his father's job, and that if she has feelings for him, she needs to tell him before it's too late. She goes home and tries to determine their fate with a tarot drawing, but it doesn't exactly make her feel better with the card representing distance and separation being drawn. As we'll see, fate and destiny are a huge theme in Escaflone, uh, not only through Hitomi's use of tarot cards and divining, but also through the plans of the soon-to-be-introduced villains. 
She ends up going to talk with Amano and asking him to use her pendant to time her race. While doing this, there appears to be a lightning strike right on the track, but instead of charring Hitomi to a crisp, it delivers a sword-wielding Bishonen boy for her to run directly into. Just who are you? Where am I? The group doesn't have long to deal with their otherworldly encounter because the flash of light also brought an actual fucking dragon with it as well. I like how the dragon looks in this show too, it's almost like it's animated in a completely different style with how it stands out from the background. The swordsman, who we will know as Von Fennel, is able to slay the dragon and take its heart, but not without Hitomi's help. She is a premonition of Vaughn being impaled and is able to avert this fate by warning him. Even after the help, Vaughn is kind of a dink. I apologize for involving you and your friends in my dragon slaying. Oh, and by the way, you didn't help me slay the dragon, you know. So Hitomi bitch slaps him, and then the two of them are transported away by the same mysterious pillar of light as before. For her first episode, Escaflone sure does cram a lot in there. The pace is incredibly fast. When the series was cut from 26 to 39 episodes, the production team didn't want to cut out any of the story, so they just decided to condense more into each episode. And you can really tell. Especially later when things move along so fast that calling it rushed would be entirely fair. Although it did help to keep my attention throughout the entire runtime. Hitomi awakens in a fantastical land full of knights, dragons, magic, and furries. Her and Vaughn travel with a tribe of beastmen to the nearby kingdom of Finalia, and we learn that Vaughn is next in line to become king. There are also whispers that he has an older brother, but he's dead or something. The people of the planet Gaia refer to Earth as the Mystic Moon, and we can see the blue planet and its familiar moon hang low in the sky. This serves a few purposes for both the audience and Hitomi. For one, seeing these two celestial bodies in the sky immediately makes you feel like you're in a mysterious land full of danger and magic. And two, one of the moons is literally Earth, which is a constant reminder of Hitomi's goal to return home. Vaughn was off slaying a dragon as part of Finalia's Rite of Secession, which honestly is a pretty badass way to crown your king, though I'm not sure that it's a good system for the basis of government. But that's beside the point. The leaders of Finalia, namely Balgus, who is awesome and has a giant anime sword, promise to return Hitomi to the Mystic Moon for helping Vaughn. But before they can do that, they must complete Vaughn's coronation. Unfortunately for Hitomi, things never go to plan, and the city is attacked by a contingent of invisible enemies during the ceremony. We get our first look at the series' mecha, which are called Gaimalefs in the Escaflone universe. These machines are pretty cool, they're almost like giant suits of armor or exosuits instead of a huge tank that's piloted from a driver's seat. These things are piloted by sliding your arms and legs down into the controls for each limb, and despite the thought of putting my extremities into a tube of moving and grinding metal, it's a pretty believable way of piloting a fantasy mech. Especially since much of the mech combat in Escaflone is melee focused, with the machines trading blows with huge swords and spears. The invisible Gaimalefs attack the city and slaughter everyone. Vaughn and Hitomi run to the castle's shrine where we get our first look at the series titular mecha, the Escaflone. Vaughn thrusts the dragon heart into the big crystal heart and climbs inside, telling Hitomi to stay where it's safe. Unfortunately, basically nowhere in Finalia is safe, and it's not long before pretty much everyone is dead, and Hitomi accidentally activates a hidden power tied to her pendant, and her, along with Vaughn, are transported away in a pillar of light. Overall, this was a great second episode, just as intriguing as the first, but with more diverse visuals. The animation on display here is very good as well, it's very intricately colored and detailed. Anytime we get to see like close-ups of the inner workings of the machinery on the mechs, it's just super impressive. We're also introduced to a ton of characters, though most of them die, like poor Balgus. But we do get to meet Vaughn's childhood friend and catgirl companion, Marl, who is basically characterized as an annoying little shit. She's kinda great. Hitomi wakes up in the nearby forest with a weird mole guy trying to steal her pendant. Luckily, a knight of the neighboring kingdom of Asturia shows up. 
His name is Alan Shazar, and he leads both Hitomi and Vaughn to the nearby castle town. Uh, also, Hitomi just immediately has a crush on Alan because he looks pretty similar to Amino. Making rash threats is never a good idea. Don't draw! Draw that sword and it will be you who will die. What's that? It is my duty as a knight to answer steel with steel. I don't draw to play childish games. <sighs> Foolish boy. This is also where we get a good look at the Empire and its incredibly magical technology. Aboard a flying fortress, which appears to be a huge man-made structure built upon a floating stone, we see two characters. The blonde-haired, pretty boy Dylan Dow, who leads an elite Imperial Gaimalef squad, and a blue-haired man named Vulcan, who holds the title of Imperial Strategos. Quick aside, I did not know that Strategos was an actual word, much less rank, but it apparently stems from Greek origins and means military general, though it was also used to mean something close to military provincial governor in the Eastern Roman Empire as well. These two speak to a machine-like voice that we can assume to be their leader, and he speaks of wanting to harness the power of Atlantis. So this is where stuff gets pretty weird, as up until now, Escaflone has been a pretty standard isekai adventure. But slowly, we get to peel off the layers, so to speak. I also love the look and feel of the technology on display here. You get the feeling that this tech is just barely working. Like, whatever type of connection they're talking through is experimental, and whenever we get to see the Empire's capital, it's choked with smoke and fog. It's a stark contrast to the more primitive and mystical civilizations that take up a direct adversarial role to the Zybok Empire. We see this reflected in their Gaimalefs as well, as the Imperial Gaimalefs use more advanced technology like the stealth cloaks and liquid metal claws. Hitomi has a premonition that the Empire will attack and destroy the castle, but no one takes her at her word. Dylan Dow shows up and asks about the Escaflone, though the denizens of the castle refuse to give him any information. Eventually, Vaughn fights a duel against Alan, and ultimately loses because he's so hot-headed he just wants to go fight the Empire right now. When Dylan Dow does actually attack the castle, he destroys the whole thing pretty easily, but everyone important escapes aboard a flying ship called the Crusade. During the escape, Vaughn reveals that the Escaflone can transform into the shape of a dragon and leads away the pursuers, ultimately being captured. Vaughn is taken to one of the Zybok Empire's flying fortresses where he meets Stratagos Falcon, who is revealed to be his brother, who went missing after failing the rite of dragon slaying. It would seem that he lost an arm to the dragon and was saved by Emperor Dornkirk's technology. So now he has a cool robot arm, and the parallels to Star Wars only get stronger and stronger. Not that everything doesn't take from Star Wars. And yes, before you say it, I know that Star Wars is based on, like, old samurai serials. I get it. Yep, uh-huh, I know. Hitomi is able to prove to Alan that her powers are real by using her tarot deck. Alan and his knights agree to save Vaughn, since they also sort of have a chip on their shoulder after Zybok burned down their entire town. Vaughn fights Dylan Dow in a cool sword fight and completely breaks his brain after slashing his face. If Dylan Dow was kind of crazy before, he just goes straight insane now to the point where he just like beats the shit out of his subordinates. Vaughn is able to escape from the flying fortress with the help of Hitomi and Alan, and the crusade immediately heads towards the city of Pallas, which is the capital of Asturia. Man, I love how Palace looks. The scenery of the show is truly beautiful. It's like something directly out of a Dungeons & Dragons game that I've DM'd. On the docks, we are introduced to a princess of Asturia named Lerna. She appears to be in love with Alan, and though Alan has shown a lot of kindness to Hitomi, I kind of get the feeling that he's like that to every woman he meets as part of his chivalrous knight shtick. However, Hitomi, being a teenage girl, is totally taken by Alan and mistakes his kindness for genuine romantic interest, which is something that becomes a driving force later on. Here, though, it's important to note because it causes strain on the relationship between Hitomi and Malerna, who treats the girl from the Mystic Moon as a servant at first. You there, girl. Uh, be a dear and carry Alan's bags. Huh? Who, uh, uh, me? <laughs> That's right. I meant you. She's not a handmaiden. She's with me. We also learn from the other Princess Ares that Alan used to have another lover named Marlene, who was Malerna's sister. Damn, Alan is really picking the fruit from that family tree. 
Alan talks with King Aston and is shocked to learn that the kingdom is already in league with the Zybok Empire. In fact, Falcon is already there and blames Finalia for the earlier military clash. The king demands Alan turn over Vaughn and the Escaflone, and ultimately Vaughn ends up confronting Falcon on a bridge, who asks him to join his forces, only for them to almost be sniped by Dylan Dow, because Dylan Dow is fucking crazy. Vaughn ends up having to fight a bunch of the king's mercenaries as a test of kindness and beats them all pretty easily. We can see King Aston is a total dickwad because he's just openly talking about selling the Escaflone and then he just throws Alan in jail. But before Alan is locked away, Hitomi sees him smooch Malerna and decides to just run off, getting shoved into a burlap sack by a total weirdo working for the Empire. Vaughn saves her and they both decide to leave together. Hitomi and Vaughn come across a dragon graveyard where the Empire excavates Energists to power their Gaimalefs. The pair destroy the mine with Hitomi kind of getting in the way and falling in a giant hole. This is where Vaughn has to reveal that he also has big pretty angel wings as soon as he swoops in to save Hitomi. Turns out that Vaughn is a Draconian, one of the ancient people that descend from Atlantis. The Draconians are now things of legend and are feared because of the legends of Atlantis' destruction. We see that Vaughn's father, the King of Finalia, came across a winged woman named Vari and took her as his wife when they fell in love, despite the warnings of his advisors. After his father died, Vari would leave to try and find the missing Falcon, but never return. So Vaughn and Hitomi bond over their lost families and find that they have more in common than they originally thought. Alan shows up once more and saves the two from Dylan Dow once again, although he's gravely wounded in the process. Luckily, thanks to Malerna having a medical degree, she's able to save his life. Now, though, they must decide the next course of action, as the crew of the Crusade can't return to Palace because they're considered outlaws. They decide to go to the city of Freed, which is currently under the rule of a young prince. Yeah, the kid Prince Cheed looks suspiciously like Alan, and it's even more apparent when we learn that his mother is the late Queen Marlene, who was Alan's former lover. Their arrival in Freed gives this poor kid a lot of trouble too, as Falcon sends a doppelganger to kill Vaughn, and they ultimately learn about Hitomi's powers, while also convincing members of the kingdom that Alan is a rebel. The entire crew of the Crusade are thrown in prison, but Hitomi is able to see through the doppelganger's disguise. After Vaughn learns how to douse for invisible enemies and defeats all the Zybak soldiers sent to kill them, the Duke of Freed returns. Malerna is able to convince Duke Freed that Zybok will turn its sights on them next, and this sways him enough to name Alan as his own knight. The crew, now no longer being outlaws, asks Hitomi to use her powers to get details about the coming attack, but she refuses, saying that she doesn't want to just be used as a tool, and also she's pretty terrified from the visions as they seem pretty traumatic. While snooping in her sister's room, Malerna finds a hidden journal that confirms her suspicions that Jeed is Alan's son. She confronts Alan about this and the Duke overhears, shouting that Jeed is his son no matter what, and confirming that basically everyone knows about it. Zybok launches its armies to assault the city of Freed, but they find the castles empty. That is, until the soldiers drop the roof on them, which is one, a badass plan, and two, totally awesome. We learn that the goal of Zybok is to gain entrance to Fortuna Temple in the west, and in order to do that they need the Treasure Sword of Freed, which acts as a key. At the temple itself, Duke Freed fights with Dillendau, but then gets shot with a bunch of arrows and dies. Vaughn engages his rival, but Dillendau is ordered to retreat once more. I think the most interesting thing about this segment is that Prince Jeed actually willingly gives up the Treasure Sword after this, as he believed it was his father's wish to ultimately surrender it. As Duke Freed looked over the battlefield, he came to believe that the gods want humanity to undergo a great trial, and so Zybak must be allowed to awaken the power of Atlantis. After the battle, we see that Vaughn is stuck inside the Escaflone and bleeding heavily, and it's revealed to the rest of the crew that he's a Draconian. Malerna tries to treat Vaughn's wounds, but is confused as no matter what she does, they just won't heal. And strangely enough, Hitomi realizes that the damage on the Escaflone matches Vaughn's wounds perfectly. We're quickly introduced to another character, Dryden of Asturia, who's a total chad and is just chilling on his ship with a mermaid. 
Malerna asks Dryden for his help, and he obliges because surprise, surprise, the two are actually engaged to be married, despite not knowing much at all about each other, but I guess that's how noble marriages go. Dryden is also an incredibly wealthy merchant, and tells the Crusade crew that the Escaflone is what is known as an Ispino Gymaleth. These special mechs are built by a mysterious race of people known as the Ispino, and require a blood ritual that ties the pilot to their Gymaleth. Luckily, Dryden flicks a little hidden switch on the Escaflone, and a huge Ispino mothership shows up to repair it, only demanding, you know, a few million gold to complete their fixes. Dryden pays the bill because he's fucking awesome, and he's also a wealthy merchant who wants to help out his betrothed. Before I move on, I personally think the Ispino were the least well-thought-out part of this show. They appear from nowhere, and as soon as they show up to help the main characters, they just disappear again. They are a deus ex machina, especially the machina part, because according to the director, the Ispino are actually, like, cyborgs created by the Atlanteans way back when. It's, none of that's in the show, <laughs> just so you know, it was just made up after. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like that was something that was cut out of the 39 episode version for sure. As they repair the Escaflone, Vaughn can feel it as if it's his own body, but after they're done, he's a total badass, so I guess it's an even trade. He fights Dylan Dow and would have definitely killed him, but due to Vaughn being able to see the anguish of Dylan Dow's dead subordinates, he freezes and the Escaflone dims and falls over. Hitomi can't get Vaughn out of the deactivated mech, so she passes out and talks to him in a dream reality that appears as a beautiful place. It doesn't last long as the two see the fall of the civilization of Atlantis, and we learn that the Atlanteans originally came from Earth, and were a people so advanced that they created a machine that could turn dreams into pure energy. It made them omnipotent, but in their hubris they caused the downfall of their own civilization. As the world around them crumbles, Hitomi asks Vaughn to save them, and so he does by finally accepting who he truly is and using his draconian wings. Despite waking up from the dream, they aren't out of the woods yet, as a pair of sexy cat girls show up and demand Vaughn and the Escaflone, only stopping when Marlin intervenes. These two were saved by Falcon when they were young, and we can see that they're um, pretty attached to him now. Dryden discovers the journal of Alan's father, Leon Shazar. Upon reading it, he learns that Leon was a renowned explorer who was shipwrecked while looking for a place known as the Mystic Valley. While looking for this place, Leon meets an old man named Isaac who he befriends. Isaac learns that Leon is searching for a woman that he once saw who claimed to be from the Mystic Moon, and Isaac confirms that he himself is from that place as well. It turns out that the woman that Leon spends his life searching for, to the point that Alan believed that he abandoned his family, was actually Hitomi's grandmother, and the pendant was Leon's. Isaac is revealed to be Emperor Dornkirk, which is pretty easy to figure out since they sound the same, but he's also revealed to literally be Isaac Newton. Apparently, Isaac Newton was so obsessed with the concept of the Law of Fate after discovering gravity, that he went to Gaia after he died so that he could continue his work. Dryden gets everyone to go to the Mystic Valley with him, which they learn is in a place called Asgard. Dornkirk learns that they're approaching this sacred place and wants to stop them, but they're pretty much already inside, and not even the combined efforts of Dylan Dow and the Cat Girls can stop them. In the ruins of the Mystic Valley, Hitomi is able to read the ancient murals and explain the history of Atlantis to everyone, and they learn that the final moments of their destruction, the Atlanteans used their machine to will Gaia into existence, and also that Hitomi's pendant is part of that Atlantean machine, which is probably why it's so easy for her to influence fate and see glimpses of the future. Unfortunately, she also learns that her wishes on the pendant are also the cause of a lot of the bad stuff that's happened to the group so far, also, Vaughn's mom shows up in Force Ghost form and gives him a new Energist while explaining all this stuff. Look, there's some stuff in this show you just have to roll with, and I, I can't really go in more depth than that. Vaughn, Hitomi, and Alan are transported by a pillar of light directly to Emperor Dornkirk's throne room. He reveals that he spent his time on Gaia making this giant machine called the Fate Alteration Engine, which is not only an awesome name for a metal band, but it's also his life's work and will allow him to remake the world in a perfect state. 
It's revealed that the Escaflone is the final part of the Fate Alteration Engine, and that the trio are thrown into the dungeon. Because of Vaughn's blood right with the Ispano Gaimalef, he's able to control it from a distance, and it allows them to escape and get back to the Crusade. I just gotta say real quick, they don't use this remote control ability again, and it's kind of aggravating, because there are a whole bunch of ways that could be super overpowered. Three weeks later, the group is back in Asturia, and are no longer considered outlaws because the Empire has been acting like total assholes for a while since the truce. Dryden plans on marrying Malerno the next day, and this makes Hitomi incredibly sad, because she still has the haunts for Alan, and she sees him and Malerna sneak a final kiss. Malerna asks Hitomi to read her fortune with her tarot cards, and Hitomi purposely gives her a fake reading, and tells her to be happy and marry Dryden, which is honestly sort of a fucked up thing to do. During the wedding, Hitomi tries to interrupt and admit her plot, but she's interrupted by the duo of Ilya and Narya, who've been powered up by Dornkirk's super lucky blood. Yes, he makes artificial blood using the Fate Alteration Engine that makes people incredibly lucky after a full transfusion. Is it really dumb? Yes. Is it also really, really awesome and totally a reason that I love anime? Yes. Their super luck makes them really hard to deal with, and the two end up kidnapping Hitomi. Unfortunately for them, Whenever Vaughn and Hitomi are close, they seem to throw a figurative wrench into fate itself, and they cancel the luck blood out. There is a showdown between Vaughn and Falcon on the floating fortress, and Vaughn comes very close to killing his own brother before the intervention of Narya, who takes the final blow meant for him. The fortress explodes, and Vaughn is able to escape with Hitomi on the Escaflone, leaving Falcon to his fate. Falcon survives the wreckage of the sinking fortress, and then he gets really mad at Dornkirk and tells him to shut up because Dornkirk is an old aloof weirdo that doesn't care that Narya is dead. Dryden proposes economic sanctions on the Empire after they try to kill him at his own wedding. I mean, always thinking like a merchant, I guess. Vaughn and Hitomi both decide to go on their own to find Falcon, and they end up taking the Escaflone all the way back to the ruins of Finalia, where Vaughn plans to confront Falcon once and for all. They show up ready to fight, but are taken by surprise by the arrival of a bunch of dragons. Hitomi is saved from a dragon by Falcon, and he reveals that when he went on the dragon hunt, he realized that the creatures only attack people that have a heart full of fear and hatred, and if they were just left alone, then they wouldn't need to be slain. This really drives home Falcon's philosophy, because despite working with Dornkirk and doing some pretty despicable things, Falcon actually has a separate goal from his Imperial Master. He wants to use the Atlantean machine to end war completely, and now to do this, he asks Vaughn and Hitomi to join forces so that they can stop Dornkirk's plans. Asturia gives Folk an asylum as long as he helps them in their fight against the Empire, and we see that they go on to form an alliance against Zybok with the neighboring kingdoms. Dylan Dow shows up to fight Vaughn at the harbor, but is mysteriously teleported away. While this is happening, Alan confesses that he loves Hitomi, which is sort of weird and comes out of left field, as he spent the show toying with Malerna and lamenting his lost love. Until now, I felt like his flirting towards Hitomi was just his chivalrous personality and how he treats every lady, but I guess not anymore. Hitomi gets all mad that people are still fighting and just wishes she could go home, and that is what her pendant does. Hitomi is transported back to the Earth in a pillar of light, and finds herself waking up in the nurse's office just like in the first episode, a day before she initially went to Gaia. While Hitomi has gone back to Earth, Zybok has surrounded Asturia. Alan's long-lost sister, Selina, shows up and she's, um, not quite right? As soon as she showed up, I said out loud, oh, that's Dylan Dow. And it is. As it would turn out, Selina was kidnapped as a five-year-old and experimented on by Zybok to create an augmented soldier. Obviously, it only kind of worked, as Selina developed a crazed personality in Dylan Dow and is basically totally nutso. Also, when you think about it, this turn of events is even more fucked up than it first appears, because Alan's father, Leon, met Isaac, who went on to kidnap Selina and bring her to the Imperial capital to be experimented on. Bro, Isaac Newton is a fucking asshole who kidnaps his friend's children to stick in a giant fate machine. Hitomi comes to the realization that she doesn't really like Amino that much, which isn't a huge surprise because she just spent 23 episodes not thinking about him. And conversely, Alan realizes he doesn't really love Hitomi either. She just reminds him of his sister. 
which is a whole can of worms that I just don't want to open right now. Ultimately, Hitomi realizes that her feelings for Vaughn are what is most important to her, so she repeats the steps that she took in episode 1 and returns to Gaia, promising never to leave Vaughn again. Back on Gaia, Hitomi hurries to Asturia while Vaughn stays behind to help some soldiers fend off the Zybok advance. In the capital, everyone prepares to go to battle. Dryden gives his ring back to Malerna, saying that he wants to be a better man so that one day she'll truly love him. Which is a really quick change of heart for him, but okay. Hitomi talks to Falcon and realizes that he's going to go speak with Dornkirk, and he reveals that because of his augmentations and his alliance with the Emperor, he will soon die. An alliance generally uses his ultimate weapon during the battle, which is basically just a nuke, and destroys the majority of both Zybok and the alliance armed forces. Hitomi and Falcon use a pillar of light to appear before Dornkirk, who invites Falcon to try and kill him. Falcon does just that, but because of their proximity to the Fate Alteration Engine, every action has a separate but equal reaction, and Falcon's sword breaks, impaling and killing him. Much to Hitomi's dismay, the engine starts up anyway, and Dornkirk appears before her in Force Ghost form. When the engine kicks on, it produces what is known as the Zone of Absolute Fortune, which makes everyone within it reveal their deepest desires. Apparently that desire is to kill each other, as the alliance breaks down and everyone starts fighting. Vaughn has his final duel with Dylan Dow, who keeps flipping between their two personalities, finally settling on Selena when Vaughn kills her dog friend Jujika. Oh yeah, apparently this dog guy has been Dylan Dow's caretaker since they were captured, but they only show up in the last two episodes, so we can chalk that up to being a part of the condensed script, I think. Vaughn decides to kill Dylan Dow anyway, and Alan steps in to stop him. The two give in to their desires to fight each other and fight a brutal duel until Hitomi can show up to stop them. Hitomi and Vaughn fly to the Empire's capital, and their pure love for each other is able to overcome the field from the Fate Alteration Engine, allowing the two to stop it once and for all. Though while Dornkirk fades away, he wonders if this peace can truly last. If men's deepest desires is to destroy one another, how long can they keep those desires at bay? Hitomi and Vaughn put the Escaflone to rest alongside Falcon's grave, and Hitomi bids Vaughn farewell, deciding that she needs to return home to the Mystic Moon. And so Hitomi gives Vaughn her pendant, much like Leon gave the pendant to her grandmother, and the two part ways, content to keep each other in their memories. And that, my friends, was the story of the vision of Escaflone. Going into the show, I had absolutely no idea what it was about, other than its focus on mecha and romance. What I got was something that went way out into left field and then came back again. It's filled with these types of things like the Fate Alteration Engine and Isaac Newton being the bad guy that's strapped into a giant golden machine. It's just crazy shit that can only work and happen in anime. and. That's the whole reason that I love this genre. Not to mention that Escaflone has great animation, an incredibly well-defined 90s aesthetic, and fucking awesome music. One thing that definitely stands out in this show is it's incredibly fast paced. Every episode has so much happen that you really need to be paying attention due to the script being condensed while the team was reluctant to cut anything. It makes for a really dense viewing experience, but the show still feels well paced and thought out even in the moments where you can tell certain aspects needed more time. Overall, I'm incredibly happy with the way Escaflone turned out. I went in expecting a romance mecha show in the vein of Full Metal Panic, but I got something much different. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please hit the sub button and like as well, and I'll see you next week when we take another deep dive into anime. See you then! Hey there, and welcome to the end card. I didn't forget this time, surprisingly. Man, this one was a way longer video than I thought it was going to be. I'm actually surprised I got it done, to be honest with you. I thought this was going to be like 20 minutes, and it was like 35. So thank you for watching. If you made it all the way to the end, please let me know. I always appreciate seeing that in the comments. My cat is screaming next to me because she's fat, which is a good thing. Um, anyway, yeah, this week I actually streamed on YouTube, which was nuts, because when I stream on Twitch, I get, like, nine viewers, but my YouTube stream got, like, 104 peak concurrent viewers, so I guess 
we are saying goodbye to Twitch because why why bother? At that at that point, fuck it. <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, man. I I really loved Escaflone. That that show was great. So next week it's gonna be Gundam X. Gundam X is is awesome. And then I'm excited because I already have um, the whole month of September planned out on my schedule with five anime videos on it and two gaming videos. So that's seven videos. Two of the weeks in September, you guys will hopefully be getting two videos, one on Tuesday and one on Friday. So we'll see what we can do there and if that's a thing that like I can actually keep up with. If not, it is what it is, but I don't want gaming videos to take the place of any anime videos because the anime videos are sort of what this channel is 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 based on but either way we're gonna branch out into a little other content as well again thank you guys for watching if you made it all the way all the way to the end excuse me <clears throat> please let me know and we will see you next week with gundam x bye bye